Hi, this is Cindy. And Michael. From Part Time Permies. And we have, I think, about a 15 second delay. So let us know if you can hear us and we'll go on from there. But um, there we go. I can see myself now. <laughs> so I heard some people got snow this last weekend. We did not. Nope. No snow. Not at all. It's Although. Been dusting we on Friday. Yeah, we still have some on the ground, just barely. Um, yeah, your mom got less than an inch but on the southern end of the storm. Tina got uh, a little over a foot. Carrie got rain. <laughs> so, hello, Bree, Carrie, Suburban Hillbilly, Tina. We're um, cold. We got some of our coldest weather for the yeah, we got season. A, but We got down to 7. It was 7 degrees when I woke up this morning. So, yeah, it was cold. Um, but did I miss anyone? Incense shop and your mom. So, cool. So, welcome, you guys. We are going to go through a few things. Today, we have, of course, a normal... We're back to our featured forge food. Um little tired? No. <laughs> just yawning. Just breathing. Um, just breathing. Um, and then we have, of course, the Ask the Chef, which we have a couple questions for. And we had a couple videos out this week, so just a quick rundown on those. We got a bloopers video out from the mac and cheese video, so je oh, Jello. Puddin wanted to take over the show, um, and I keep doing that. And she's just going to keep getting Jello's name. <laughs> And then we also just today released a lacto fermented pepper sauce video that uh, was recorded over two different periods of time. So uh, there was a gap of a, about three or four weeks. Yeah, I want to say just shy of a month, I think. Yeah. So. Which usually you can do between about two weeks and six months or so on a. Yeah. <clears throat> lacto ferment, but we got good flavor out of it. Yeah. No, it tasted pretty darn good. Um. And really two types in a way because you took the hotter peppers for one and then yeah I had some them. hot peppers blended in but then I had a lot of hot peppers I didn't know exactly how hot they were so we did put a whole bunch of them together just so we didn't we like it very pretty hot to very yeah. hot but didn't want to kill the whole thing if it was extremely hot yeah no turned out and, and pickling takes the heat down a little bit so turned out they're the, even the hot ones really good yep so um I was just reading. Yeah, she was very thirsty, Tina, on that uh, bloopers video. Oh, we got Australia. Pudding. Oh, cool. Oh, coming into summer. Yeah, Matthew, you guys are, I hear our friend in Australia has raspberries right now. I'd love to have some raspberries, fresh raspberries that are local, but not yeah, the right time here. About a week ago here. or so, he had raspberries. Yeah, yep. So one of our best friends lives in Australia. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um. So yeah, uh, Puddin, if you didn't, if you've watched today's video too, she kept bombing, doing photo bombs in the back or video bombs in the background, passing through and stuff on the fermented uh, pepper sauce video as well. So, okay, let's see here. Yeah, I know in the south, you guys got a lot of precipitation. Suburban Hillbilly got a lot of rain, also known as mud. <laughs> um... And, yeah, here we got no precipitation. It was sunny today, bright, bright sunny. Got up to 33, but it started the day at 7. So it was definitely very cold. But, okay, so I'm just going to go straight into this. We did get the greenhouse, for the most part, done. We have some gaps we got to fill um, and things. And I just filled these kitty litter buckets um, full of water to try to create a little more of a heat sink in there. Uh, the reason is today, if our low was seven and our high was 33, the bottom right corner of this temperature um, thermo thermometer here, you can see the greenhouse low and high temperatures for today. Low of 19 when I woke up this morning, it was seven outside, it was 19 in the greenhouse. So it is keeping it at least around 10 12 degrees like warmer 10 degrees warmer and then when we have sun on it we shoot up about 30 but it hit 30, 35 that's yeah. 40 over 40 degrees warmer and we don't want to go any higher than that because that's too shocking of a yeah. 
change. Change. We don't need things growing in seventy much over seventy five degrees. So. So that's a huge change in temperature in the greenhouse today. Um, so yeah, that was just from. It's partially because the sun was probably shining directly on, um, the uh, thermometer there, but um, it did pretty well. The humidity's a little on the lower side, but I think that'll go up with some plants in there. <clears throat> Trees again. Yep. Yeah, hi, Teresa. Yeah, I don't know if the, I mean the sun isn't really the sun is shining on the whole on the whole plastic, but yeah. it's not hitting the thermometer so much. It it was because it goes in. It actually shines in that window. Yeah, yeah, it does shine in. So it does for a little bit. It shows shines directly on it, but you know not for very long in the day. So that is a huge range in temperature. But um, so our goal is to try to figure out how to. And the more stuff we put in there, the more heat things we'll have. So I think it'll actually not get as cold at night if we have yeah, stuff in Yeah, it's an empty there. space right now. So, um, so starting to fill that up and get it set. Uh, where is your sensor? It it's, is about four feet high. It's on the ledge of the bottom ledge of the window. Although. Not quite four feet. I want to say it's like. So it's root. actually a nice moderate. It's a little less than halfway to the top. Yeah. So it's actually it's away from the area where the plants will be sitting. It's against the house, which could affect things a little bit too. Um, the plants will be further out, um, but it's about the same height as where our shelves will be. Yeah, so, so it's a decent yeah. sentinel nut. So I'll actually go back here um, to this picture. So I'm planning on putting some boards across that ladder, and then I have two sawhorses. You see one of them in this picture. So about three, three and a half feet high there. Um, you can see put in there. The window is just behind this rocking bench. Um, so it's about, I'd say three, three and a half feet high there too. About the same height as the ladder, I would, I'm guessing. So maybe three and a half. Um, but it's closer to the house. So it may be getting some warmth off the house as well. So I should, once I get a shelf on that ladder, I probably should put it out there. Um, hi, Lois Ann and Green Gables. Hello, hello. More people. And PJ. I almost said PJ. PG Nano Farm. Um, so we're getting more and more people coming in. Cool. Anyway. Are we going to keep a log? I don't know. I actually have I have logging um, thermostats, uh, thermometer and humidity logs in my pasta production. I yeah. have two of them running. In fact, I just downloaded them recently to make sure they're working because they do like 20,000 data points. We could possibly put something like that in there. I don't know how much we would use it. Uh, it might be interesting to see at least this first year the ranges yeah, and temperatures. About, the ones um, I got were about 30, 30 some dollars. Yeah. And that's cheap because they can run seven Well, she found them for $10 at Lowe's. Well, this is this is a digital log. Theirs here. was two. Yeah. Yes. The one I have out there right now is one I got from a neighbor when he actually sold me some of his growing stuff. Um, so uh, I've actually had it out. I would put it outside um, this summer to put in the silky, the mobile silky coop, because I was a little worried on how hot it might be getting. Um, but it was still out there, so I brought it in finally and put it in the greenhouse. Um, but, oh, thanks, Suburban. Tried yeah. the pasta. Oh, good. Thank you. Yep. yep. Just put out a new shape and a new flavor at market on Saturday. Yeah, we so, don't have it online yet. But. No, I don't have it dried. I just have it in fresh because it, it just came off of import on uh, last week, Friday, put it into production and checked it. And about all I could do was get some fresh out. Please don't ask me to pronounce it. Yeah, there's a few of them are a little bit funny. If you write it out, it will pronounce it for The you. nice thing about Italian um, words, as difficult as they can be, you actually sound out every syllable. There's nothing silent. So... Yeah, uh, you can get pretty close compared to other languages where sometimes there's some tricks. Yeah, the uh, only I think trick that gets people sometimes is on the Grimenia because the G N is like the same sound as you have in lasagna at the end of the word. So people get uh, mixed up on that one. Um, hi, Valerie. Um, so, yeah, we had uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, put an update. Well, this is just a picture, but <laughs> put in sleeping and can't hold her head up. But who got to walk her this week? I walked her. On her own. I let, walked her before. She let you put the collar on? Yes. How many times? Well, the two times that I... Two times so, so far. I had to chase her around a bunch for this one. Yeah. 
Yeah. She was going in circles and bouncing back and forth and grumbling and growling and woofing and and then once you put the collar on she her, wouldn't stay very far away but so no. i i knew she wanted to go she wanted to go but yeah we i finally had to get her inside and then as soon as she went in the living room she lay down sat down but yeah i knew that it was going to be a little bit of a force not forced but a project to get her to submit to take it it took me three three times to get her to not completely relaxed, but lay down and let me put the collar on her. And then once she gets the collar on, she's, she's fine. She's fine. So she's a little nervous to go out to the woods and back, but we've done her a couple walks. Yeah, and you always come with me, so it's, but yeah, she's yeah. fine. She's just used to patterns and yeah, she's used. To, she's gotten used to my putting the collar on right. her. She did a lot of running, a lot of running around, about ten minutes before before going so. for a walk. Yeah. Oh, the crested agayo or, or yes. gallo, depending on. So a. Uh, gallo or gallo, depending on Spanish, is almost the same. Yeah, uh, is a chicken. Yep. And the crest is it's the, the comb. is the comb. So it's a rooster comb. Yep. So uh, yeah. Or a cox some cox comb in French French cuisine. Um, sometimes they actually cook them, but there's very few of them around, and they're kind of more gelatinous. So uh, the pasta might be more desirable than the actual real thing, but they're kind of a delicacy. And auto correct. Yeah. Yep. Well, we figured it out. Crested de Gallo. Um, yeah, that's actually one of our newer shapes for that. Um, yeah, it sells well. Yeah. People like it. It's different. It's hard to find in the United States without getting it from a from Italian. A, from an Italian import, uh, yeah. especially Italian import. So. Yep. So um, I'm trying to think what else we have here going. Well, I could get on to this week's uh, Forge food feature. Um, since we have a number of people who've joined in already this week, anybody know what this plant is? And if you've seen my post on the blog, you'll get to cheat on it, but anybody know it's not in flower this time of year. And obviously we have no bees out this time of year either. This was taken, um, this picture was taken in August. Um, I want to say around August It's late summer, early fall is when this one blooms. Um, it's a tall plant, it, although it could be anywhere from three feet to nine feet tall. Uh, and yep. the Green Gables has it. Sun chokes or Jerusalem artichokes. Um, there's been some talk and debate and on the foraging. Artichokes. That, 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 that's, the <laughs> oh, no. that's the farmer's market slang around. <laughs> um, well, if you actually want to take a peek at the... They do look like Black Susans. are just a little bigger. And they don't Not have... Not quite as dark. Actually, the bee is covering the flower on this, but um, it's a yellow center on the flower instead of a black center. And they are a lot bigger of a plant than um, the Black Eyed Susans. Um, but if um, if you go through... Yeah, they do... Can, if if you harvest these too early in the season, or if you um, harvest them early in the season, don't cook them. They do tend to cause a lot of gassiness. So you got to be careful. And, I, with that. and it's funny because I heard that a few years ago. I've been cooking with them for, I'd say, well over ten years. I've been using them often on right, usually in the late fall, winter when they're seasonal. And I've used them in Hi. all kinds of different things, as we talked about a few weeks ago. Uh huh. And I never knew they were a gas issue uh, with <laughs> any, but I think also may depend on the quality. Or the whatever. type. There's yeah. a lot of varieties as well. There's a wild one. It is not from Jerusalem, and it is not an artichoke. So how someone came up with the name Jerusalem artichoke um, is a whole different question, except for the fact that um, there's a theory that the Spanish and Italian name for sunflower actually sounds Kind of like Jerusalem, Girasol, I don't know how to Girasol, or um, or Girasol, but or Girasol, Girasol, yeah. Gir yeah. You I'm don't have a that. you don't have a J in Italian, but a G sounds like a like J. A J. Okay. So. so yeah, I obviously don't speak. So we've got a bunch of people. We got Atlanta. Wow, and actually, we got a whole bunch of new people hanging out. Um, hello, everybody. Wow, everybody just. A lot of new oh, Roots and Refuge there. finished up. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So, yeah. Awesome. So Roots and yeah. Refuge. Must, uh, did Roots and Refuge know we were on tonight? That's awesome, We've too. We've got uh, 
Texas. Yep, got a couple of people cool. in from Texas, Atlanta, so, which had some time. You know, I've talked about. It. I've spent some time yeah. down in the Atlanta area over a number of years ago. Absolutely. So why don't you guys? Since we have a lot of new people joining in, we talk a lot about forged items. So if you guys don't mind just mentioning what state you're in so people know kind of different regions of where we are, because obviously we're in Michigan, we're in frigid cold this time of year, and um, uh, what we have might be a little different than, say, what's down in Texas and where it's, well, kind of warm well, now. I, I made a mistake similar to what state are you in at one of the hospitals that I did a market last year saying, how you doing? And had an OR nurse say, upright and ventilating was their, was was their there. state. And I'm like, oh, of course. Oh, no. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, upright and ventilating. I hope so. Oh. Yeah. So anyway, we do have a whole lot of people. A lot we of Southern 58 today. 58 people who just, yeah, Roots and Refuge had a great. huge show. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. So we, got a lot, we got a lot of people coming from the South, which is great. Yep. We talked about with everybody who got bombarded with the East Coast snow, being in Michigan and being, we got really cold today. We got a dusting Friday, and but we're, that we storm has not, will not hit us. No. So we actually missed it. We had six inches a week ago. It yeah. melted a little bit. So. Yeah. We're down to just dusting now. Yeah. So. Um, Midwest Michigan, Los Angeles. Yes, you're a neighbor of ours, kind of. You're in the state anyway. So we're kind of talking about our uh, featured, featured forge. or forage food Friday item. Yeah. So every weekend I try to feature a forged item on our website for those of you guys who are new and then we talk about it on our live show so we're getting a new forged food each week that you can go out and harvest and eat or use medicinally um and the key is there's a link to our web page where Cindy in the description has a much more detailed usually yep. a one or two pager uh with what pictures that she does and then additional stuff Yep. And my background as a chef, I cook with all this stuff uh, regularly. Hey, for, Roots and Refuge. And then we've got um, Cindy uh, works as a genetic counselor and with a biology background, does some of the background on and research. the medical and traditional uses um, so that you can combine if you like to grow it, you like to forage it, you like to cook it, you want to know yep. what it might be doing that's good for you or how it can supplement your diet. Uh, it kind of gives you a big uh, blend of everything. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So if you look in the description below, we do have a link to the web page um, that has the featured forage food and you can join following along with that. If you're interested, this week's forage food feature is the Jerusalem artichoke, sunchoke, jchoke, or sunroot, whatever you want to call it. So um, it, were you going to say something else? No. How, mm -hmm. how many people have eaten them before or regularly like to eat them? I think they're coming into popularity over the last 10 years, I'm seeing a more and more fine dining. Cooking-wise, we've used them for a long time. Farmers markets have rediscovered them a long yeah. time ago. And I think they're one of my favorite. They've been one of my favorite things to cook with and work with because they're inexpensive, even though they're sold at a premium now. Mm -hmm. um, they're a good calorie crop. They're very healthy. Easy to grow. And you can cook them in about like six different ways. You can grow them oh, almost yeah. anywhere across the whole country. So all around. And they have really nice earthy but a little sweet. Mm -hmm. and mild and, and somewhat neutral flavor so you can Put it lend them a to stuff. a lot of different things which means they truly are a, a sustaining hey, Cindy, farm said. crop but yeah. also they're a gourmet thing to kind of surprise people with working with something else so yeah, yeah. so this jerusalem artichoke um is native to primarily the central part of north america so through the plain states all the way east to the atlantic but kind of the central atlantic states you can find it growing in other places in the country now because it has become cultivated. And there are a, variety, a whole variety of different cultivars that you can grow. But the... I think um, Johnny sells about six different varieties. Yeah. And that's just a that's just a highly desirable edible ones. Yeah. Uh, but people use them a lot for soil, uh, holding back soil, and a lot of animal feed and creating green manures and, you know, restoring soil. Uh, and so those don't necessarily have to be of amazing eating quality. 13 uh, Moons has a question. Do, and by the way, since there's so many people who joined in here, if you have questions for us, put it in all caps so I can see them mm -hmm. as people are chatting. Um, Did you but, have pictures of the root? I know you got the picture of the flower. You know, I don't have a picture of the root right now. I should have looks, pulled it some It looks up. a lot like ginger. It's really knobby, um, which I'm about to laugh because that's our forged food uh, 
or foraging guide. His name is Nobby too, but it's a, like a, it's a root that's a very light color, white color root that is fairly knobby. Um, kind of triangular shaped a lot of them uh, yeah. because they grow out in these bulbous sort of tubers. I thought you had a picture on Instagram recently. I don't know. I'd have we to, have, I didn't see it. Well, so. maybe, some, maybe something from the market. Yeah. I do the farmer's market every week, so I'm always got stuff going on with. Um, yep. There's nope. a lot of sun chokes there right now. And nope. yes, you can roast them, by the way, the question about yes. roasting them. Um, <clears throat> because depending on their maturity and the variety, the skin can be more roughed up or very smooth and thin. Yeah. Um, just like a potato can have different styles. So if you find that it's kind of coarse, either peel it or half peel it. And mm -hmm. then uh, I like to, if they're small, roast them whole. But you can cut them into chunks, like rough kind of triangular chunks, say a half inch to an inch large toss them in olive oil or whatever, and then uh, roast them like any other roasted vegetable. They'll do great, and they'll kind of get a little collapse, and they'll sweeten up like other root vegetables. Um, and they are phenomenal roasted, but you can puree them, mix them 50-50 with potato if you want them even creamier. You can make them into soup, uh, like a nice pour, you know, like a nice puree soup uh, or sliced. You mm -hmm. can fry them uh, into little chips. Um, I Yeah, there's there's a... They don't, million things you can do with them. I read that. Oh, no, you're the chef, so I'm going to ask you this. I read that the chips don't fry up as crispy as like potato chips. They're um, a little bit soft. Well, yeah, because uh, they don't have a high. They have a higher sugar that, to starch content. A, a complex. Um, you need more complex starch. That's why we pick starchy potatoes for frying. They will get pretty crispy. We cut them really thin on a okay. mandolin, like a Japanese mandolin. Um, and if you fry them in good fresh fry oil and a little bit at a time, you get that water all the way out. The other thing we would do is we'd stick them under a warming light, which has um, restaurant warming lights have um, infrared on them. So it penetrates about an inch into the surface. And so that helps dry them out. So if you flash fry them, you put them on paper to drain some of the oil, mm -hmm. and then you lay them under that lamp for a half hour, um, it will pull out some of that extra moisture and keep them uh, more crispy because eventually they'll, yeah. they'll darken if you cook them too long. Uh, the other thing that happens is you can coat them very, very lightly in a rice flour or a cornstarch or something like that and just dust them and shake them off and fry them. Uh, but then you got to make sure they don't uh, clump up. So, okay. yeah, they'll be a little softer, but I don't find a problem with them. Just cut them really thin. And as far as um, artisan brand, bard uh, saying Jerusalem artichoke can be invasive, they are aggressive. They spread through their root system. So I wouldn't put it in the vegetable garden. We planted ours under our apple trees. Um, for a couple of reasons, you can harvest them there. They can do what they need to do. They, you can, uh, chop and drop them for green mulch for the apple trees and they do well there. I think your ruminants will eat the whole stalk and everything. Uh, we don't have any. Pigs will dig them up like crazy. Yeah, we don't because yeah. they're sweet. They have a yeah. little sweetness to them. Um, yeah, they do. They really, they really, um, grow outward. So the best thing you can order them online, they charge you a lot of money because they're heavy to ship them. Go to your farmer's market or yeah. your higher-end grocery store or specialty grocery store or produce market. They'll probably have them this time of year. Just buy them and hold them in your fridge or plant them now. Um, they'll take off. And what happens is if you pull out a lot of them, they'll always leave bits behind. Um, so then it will. So you'll end up always getting a batch. In fact, I was told if you let them go about three seasons and you don't harvest them, yeah. Uh, for some reason, they'll actually start clouding. They'll crowd they'll each other crowd out. Crowd each other out, and they'll die, and they'll create an outgrowing ring uh, where they continue to grow, but they'll kill the center because they're they're clogged in yeah. there. So they'll eventually kill themselves off. Yeah, um, but they are. Do put them in a place where they have some space. Do put them in a place where you don't mind having some outgrowth because uh, you will have a little bit of a fight to remove them. Um, and if you try to remove them, the, it is like a lot of others that spread through tubers. Um, if you try to remove them, you're actually just going to uh, enrich their growing condition because any little bit of root left in there will keep the growing. Soil, so yeah. so um, you're loosening the soil, you're thinning them out, you're actually giving them the perfect Well, they grow in Western growth. Oregon. I assume they will. They, I've seen, they're not natural to the West Coast, but they do grow and in some areas they they take prefer over a, a cooler winter, but they will take all the way till you get really really hot. Sorry, Carrie, I'm not sure. If they do grow in they, Texas. They do grow in that in the high heat and dryness in Texas. Yeah, well, they grow in Texas. Um, now I'm not sure if they grow in the driest areas of Texas because the the ones that um, grow naturally do grow in a little bit wetter areas. 
a um, little bit boggier area. So the wild Jerusalem artichokes are natural down to Texas and all the way over to Georgia and all the way up um, to like probably around the New York area and then back west, the Dakotas. So mm -hmm. all the way through like that middle section of east of the Rockies, uh, they do grow naturally. Um, and so they are they may be aggressive but they are would not yeah, be so we have we have a confirmation of growing in western washington yes yep, yep. um so yeah they can grow yep. there it's just they didn't cross the mountains until yeah so basically they should be able to grow everywhere across yep. the, the continental united states yep. and i'm sure they'll grow in alaska too yeah, and the, the question, can you double fry the chips? Yes, you can double fry them to help yeah. improve crisping, uh, but they will darken because of that a little bit higher sugar content. They'll eventually get go from you know, a little too dark if you don't watch them. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's... Uh... So I'm flipping back and forth. So they are a good permaculture plant if you're doing like a food forest area uh, because they are perennial. They'll keep coming back. They make a good uh, living mulch. That you can use birds and, and bugs they hold moisture in and they're humidity. great pollinator yeah. plant yeah um and as far as culinary uses i do have i don't have recipes someone asked that specifically but i do have a list of different ways you can do it you can basically do the same thing you could do with almost any of your root vegetables you can yeah. do with use them similar to a potato but they because they have uh, they're a little more coarse if you peel them all the way down they'll still be a little not as uh, they won't take on as much moisture. You can make a nice pure mash, but I like to blend them with some potato or a mix of, of root vegetables. Um, and then uh, other than that, yeah, roasting and pure. As far as making them into soup, peel them all the way down, cook them all the way till they're tender, and add them. in other root vegetables. So we would do things like celery yak and, and uh, you know, sunchoke and maybe a little potato. Mm. Puree it, making it in a vegetable stock or a chicken stock. Uh, blend blend it up into uh, we just made potato leek soup last night which could have um, used that with her yeah and that would have been a perfect to add that in or or do it in the same style with leeks or other things um, <laughs> puree it up and then uh, and then you can finish with a little bit of butter or olive oil or, or some cream uh, it doesn't need a lot just to bring out the flavor salt pepper uh, you get fancy and put some fried ones or diced ones or whatever yeah. on top for. Uh, now here's, we used to do truffle oil or put lobster in it and other things. Here's so. the thing for you guys in the South. Um, the one thing with um, the the Jerusalem artichokes that make people sometimes a little gassy after eating them. You can eat them raw, but that might... I like them raw. I actually think they're really good raw. They are, but if you get them before they convert their starches to sugar, the inulin, inulin in the... Um, Jerusalem artichoke is the not digestible yeah, so it's, like the, yeah. it's one of the starches that goes straight through the system but it's also what the bacteria in your system start breaking down and that's why people get gassy after um a, you know you get a few frosts all that starch is converted into sugar so really what you want to do is not harvest them until after you've had a few frosts and the plants are basically or dying leave, back or leave them in your fridge for a week or two um, or cook them. Yeah. Cooking them will break it down as well and convert it, uh, which is why a lot of people won't eat them raw. Yeah. But the wild ones might have more of the inulins in them than the um, than the cultivated ones as well. So the cultivated ones might be a little safer for that rather than harvesting or foraging for them out in the wild. The question about growing conditions. Yeah, they can grow in full sun. They can grow in partial sun. Um, yeah, they're pretty tolerant. We have them under our apple trees. Our apple trees are not moderate sun. Tall. They get some morning. They get morning afternoon. and you get three quarters. They of the did day. fine. We got there were six. Fine. We had two different varieties, six feet tall. They flowered. Yeah. Uh, we didn't pull many of the. We uh, planted them in the spring. So. We planted them in the spring, so we didn't mess with them this year um, much. Uh, we're going to probably have an abundance of them next year, but that's fine. Yeah. Um, and we have them in the back of the garden, in around yeah. the apple trees, trying to create a micro climate environment uh to supplement the other things around the apple trees yeah so basically we're doing that and in... we have super sandy soil so yeah. um we're trying to always build soil it's very loose and and can be uncompact it's not very compacted uh but we're trying to build um material and hold water and, and this um, is a great keep, plant keep things that. from blowing around a little bit so this is a good way to build all of that it's a big carbon um sink so basically any plant that's growing that fast 
you cut it down in the fall and you just mulch with it and it's a great way to fertilize your your soil around that area and cooking with celery stuff yes i do not know if celery well uh epizote well that is a traditionally latin american uh, you know mexican uh plant which if you go to spanish markets and you're lucky mm -hmm. uh sometimes you can get it fresh you can also mm -hmm. buy it dry uh, it has a flavor similar to oregano and is frequently cooked with beans or other things. One, because it tastes good, and two, because it is definitely known to reduce um, gas. In fact, I think the Beano or one of those, you know, over-the-counter meds is made with something okay. natural. I want to say it's that Pizzotti. It's made with a natural. It's it's nothing special. Yeah. Uh, they've just put a brand on it. And, uh, so Epizote is one um, really good method for cruciferous, you know, broccoli, cabbage, vegetables. Um, and some yeah. of the really starchy things, but I don't know if so. Celery is very high in nitrates and is fairly salty hmm. naturally and has a, a very penetrating flavor, even though it's a low level flavor, but I don't know if it affects uh, other things. So, uh, celery root, by the way, celery root and, and uh, sun chokes cooked together make a wonderful puree soup. Hmm. I've done that. It could be. I mean, we'd have to look that one up yeah, and check on it. Uh, because if that's the case, that might also be why they cook those two things together sometimes. Yeah. Besides well, yeah, the I flavor. put celery in almost every soup that's and all true. kinds of you know, things. So. Um, so sometimes you have very mild winters and it might only freeze a few times. So after it's frozen a few times, you can harvest it. The other thing is you can, you can harvest, harvest them all winter. Yeah. You can harvest them otherwise. Um, it's just... Like if you're in a warm area like that where it just frosts over sometimes, um, you just want to make sure you cook it because it's just going to, you can still eat it. It's just not mm -hmm. going to be. Um, well, and if you eat a high, if you eat a high vegetarian or vegan diet where you're eating a lot of roughage and a lot of cabbage and beans on a regular basis, it might be more your useful. body chemistry adjusts. So what it is, is you, you, the food goes less digested further into your system, past your stomach mm -hmm. and basically those starches feed the gut bacteria. They're kind of in the middle of your gut down deeper. Uh, it feeds them really well, which means they <laughs> propagate. Unfortunately, they give off gas. Yeah. Now, if you're constantly eating high, you know, these high inulin, high uh, fiber items mm -hmm. um, as a daily diet, it will subside because your body will adjust. It becomes more normal and, and it's not a big deal. It's when all of a sudden you go and eat a lot of beans, a lot of cabbage, a lot of you know these things, and you're not used to having that regular of a roughage diet, right. uh, where it becomes more of an issue. So, yeah, yeah just eat a lot. You'll have probably you know yeah. less problems. But as far as what other people were saying, um, boiling it, putting it into soups, slicing it, putting it into stir fries, roasting it with meat like other root vegetables, mm -hmm. mashing it with potatoes um, is good. Some people will slice it raw if it's you know, been after a few frosts. You really could use it like a jicama. It, it has a similar flavor and crunch and a light sweetness. Yeah. Not exactly like a jicama, but I would say that's a, if you've ever had jicama, especially had jicama I raw. Like crones. Uh, crones are a little more mild. Yeah. Uh, but that's it, true. crones would be used in a similar way. Yep. yep. Um, you crones can, we talked about, which are in the mint family, a little root from the mint family. I talked about those about a week or two ago. Uh, yeah. We've actually talked about that in relation to permaculture class because we were able to get some crones as well which is in the mint family and spreads out it's a different one yeah um but it is you eat the actual root nodules as well um heaven's gate cherry farm hello i like them um, roasted just because it's yeah. so quick and simple you yeah. just knock off any of the rough edges and knobs i kind of half peel them um you know i don't mind if they're a little bit of a crunch and a little bit of skin i like that flavor it's just if they're too too matured that uh, and i rarely find that um yeah. Cut off the rougher ends, you know, the ends, uh, the root ends. Chunk them up, toss some olive oil, salt, pepper, maybe Keep some fresh herbs. Uh, throw them in a medium hot oven and let them cook till they start to partially collapse. And yeah, they it's great. So unless anyone has any more questions about Jerusalem artichokes, you can check out if you want more of a description of what they look like and things like that. If you want to go foraging for wild ones. Uh, but you can always plant them too, so that's easy enough. Um, so yeah. But uh, the other thing we well, you were going to say. Yeah, something. So the other thing we updated for people that got in a little on the other end. Yeah. Uh, lacto fermented hot sauce video just came up. I know a lot of people do it. 
uh, but we just did a simple clean out our garden. So that finished finished up a while ago, but we have the final just product. Just posted the video. The video. We have the greenhouse update. We built a um, electrical conduit based greenhouse uh, off of our front faux porch. Uh, it was a under five hundred dollar bill that included a uh, brand door. new storm door and frame for that. And then um, so that's uh, building a greenhouse with an existing structure. Uh, we did that in a three day build under five hundred dollars. Half of that was for the door, so you could do it even cheaper with the reused. And um yeah, and that's yeah. that's basically what we had gone over. We got so a whole far. list of videos on we got some cooking videos, we've got some build videos, got lots of chicken videos. Don't have much going on with the chickens right now. Yeah, I need to do an update um, on them. You know, we because it's been cold, they're less active, but they're yeah. in their winter coops now. Yep. Uh we've had no more we lost three last week to a Thanks probably a you. dog. Yeah. Um, might have been a coyote, but we think I think I, what I saw was a dog. It was off yeah. in the distance, but we've been fine. No more issues with that. Yeah. And so the chickens are just kind of on hold, uh, doing their thing. We're getting a few eggs, not very much. Yeah, we don't supplement the light. Um, but one other thing we do, one other segment we always do each week at nine, um, we do our forage food feature, and then we do ask the chef. So since and this is open to any questions that you can you want to ask um this was so actually any, anybody know what that is what's, anybody know what what's on what that well, i'll give is. you a hint the first part it's a pancake well yeah uh, <laughs> that's a buttermilk pancake i had to buy some buttermilk we did some pan fried chicken this week which didn't do a video on it it was just a um i don't make fried chicken very often at home we don't it's just i don't know it's we just do it every once in a while yeah. so i did a, a traditional buttermilk marinated fried chicken and um, so I, I decided to buy the half gallon of buttermilk because it's almost the same price as the little one. And then I had to decide what to do. So I made some buttermilk pancakes, just some quick scratch pancakes this morning. And then um, this, we never did a video on it. This, it looks like capers. They're actually um, much smaller. They it's are the about the size oh. of salmon eggs, a little oh. smaller than currants. Uh, smaller than oh, autumn olives. Much smaller than autumn olives, like the small olive um, this was for a Not blueberry. summer forage demo that I had to do for the Rotary Club. They asked me to talk on uh, foraging, and it was the middle of the summer, and we were in a dry, like a six-week, eight-week dry spell. And so I scrambled for what we could forage because we were pretty much out of forage. And I gave a quick talk. You got talk. this from Nobby? Uh, no, I didn't. I got it from oh, okay. another local farm. Uh, Nobby has it sometimes. But those are um, elderberries. So yep. they're they're very dark purple, almost black, and they have these little clusters. Yep. Um, and it, you know it's a it's a head with all these little clusters. Yeah, oh. they, they actually look very much like papaya seeds. <laughs> but they're um, not. <laughs> they taste better than papaya seeds. Elderberry, thirteen moons got it. Oh. Uh, lingonberries, I love their lingonberries are bigger. Working with a lot of frozen yep. lingonberries uh, over the years. So we had our own maple syrup. We had the elderberries with the syrup. Well, that's elderberries and honey. And honey. I Sorry. So what yeah. I did was I took the elderberries to preserve them, put them into, uh, we have some Michigan honey. It's a raw Michigan honey. It's actually sold in, in bulk and expensively yeah. to a big store. Uh, and I, but I just, I, it wasn't any of our special honey from a friend. I didn't want to ruin it or, uh, so we infused it. And a lot of people say that infusing it not only makes a nice flavor of the elderberries, but can be fairly, you know, medicinally, you know, good stuff. So, uh, so that's one of the first times it's been sitting in the fridge since August or <laughs> end of July. Yeah, that um, was good. That we used it, and but it's a nice way to preserve it. Now it's thinned out a lot because the juices from the elderberries went into the honey, and yeah. I do keep it refrigerated. I think it would mold. Um, naturally, the the honey won't, but because of the extra water. Yeah. But it actually has done a very good job of preserving the elderberries for the long term into the winter. Yep. And a lot of people say the elderberries are perfect for what, colds and oh, yeah, uh, winter colds. So cold and flu um uh, help prevent a lot of that. We wanna um, we did we plant an elderberry? I think so. We planted this year. two elderberry plants. We don't have this year. any yet, but we're yep. looking forward to So them. hopefully they'll grow well. Again, we're very dry, sandy soil here. So um we have them in a deep bed of leaf mulch. They grow really well in our general area, just our property is yes. perfect for it. But there there's a number of people that have cultivated and quite a bit. So yeah. Yeah, elderberry syrup on buttermilk pancakes. Yep. So, yeah, and the 
uh, maple syrup was from our own trees from the spring Let's as see, well. See the best. I've had a lot of good honeys from around the world. Mm -hmm. around. Yeah, I mean Mi Michigan has because we have a lot of agriculture and a lot of fruit, and we're right in the fruit belt. Um, mm -hmm. The honey that is a really a byproduct of of keeping the fruit and orchards healthy, a yeah. lot of strawberries and berries and such. Um, we have a lot of apples. It's very nice. Um, apple so. orchards and peach. Nobby and just got our, one plum. of our farm friends. They had a share. They, for the first time in a while, they had a lot of hives put on their property. Yeah, they did. And they get a small share of that honey. That just came in this week. Oh. Um, so that was, I didn't get have one. To try it. Yeah, have, so they have that. I, I think the best honey, the most interesting honey I've ever had is, um, was I think hazelnut honey. Ooh. Uh, and I want to say that came from um was it chestnut or hazelnut honey well, i think it was from italy mm. um and it was kind of dark and caramely and really really good i've had the tupelo honey i know a lot of people say that's very healthy and one of the best honeys in the world i, I find it a pretty heavy it, it's okay but mm. it's pretty heavy um so yeah we have good honey around here there's no question um so um we do have two questions on our facebook group so if you guys are interested in that um, ask the chef questions ask yeah. the chef questions so one's easy what's your favorite um pasta to make it's usually, meal to make meal to pasta? make it would be the meal i'm making right now because <laughs> um yeah that's i don't think i really have a favorite um even before making pasta as a as a business um, I like a lot of different ones. I like having a lot of choices of shapes and sometimes varieties of, of you know, dough. But um, what meal would you make with your pasta? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't have a great answer to that because I, I tend to work out of our refrigerator. <laughs> sometimes true. I plan things, but a lot of it has to do with what do I see in the market? Yeah. Because uh, I'm at the farmer's market once or twice a week selling. So what did I get traded? And I get a whole bunch handed to me from somebody. Um Oh, and Valerie has a question. Will we do bees? We would like to do bees. We We've want been to. Talking about it for three years. Um, time a, to handle it. A little bit of expertise and learning curve. Um, yeah. And and the money to just the, you know the, Start. the upfront. We don't eat a ton of honey, and if you eat even a little bit of honey, it quickly pays for itself. Yeah. And you can sell it on a pretty simple cottage law um, permit in Michigan. In Michigan. But you probably get a thousand dollars or so up front uh, because you need to get the boxes and you need to get the basic equipment. So yeah, we really want to do it, but it's I don't know if it's even going to be on next year's list yeah. as much. It's a high priority. It just hasn't. It's happened. probably the next animal we'll try to have on property. Yeah, we have chickens so. and we have two geese, but we don't. Um, bees might be the next project. Yes, yeah, um, honey, regurgitated bees, but that's all right. There's a lot of really. Things that appear very grossly made but actually taste great. So yes, that's true. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, so yeah, pasta. I like a lot of different things. Um, I like taking fresh vegetables and leftovers and whatever's available, and that's the beauty of pasta. You can turn something that's kind of boring uh, or been seen before, or you just have extra and turn it into something that's really, really good. Um, yeah. I think the key to it is having some good olive oil around and how you finish it, that you finish with some garlic or onions or fresh herbs and the, how you how you bring it all together in the end. You can just put sauce over the top, uh, which is fine, but I think that um, more, you know, that spending a little more time finishing out your, your pasta and making sure it's not a, a pasta soup with, uh, but it's a balance of garnish, sauces, uh, and things that extend flavor and then your pasta all in balance. And Xavier Hope Thomas said that she likes to wander through her garden and decide what oh, she's nice. going to Oh, nice. You got jigs, yeah. for, jigs for making boxes. Yeah, I've seen a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, and, cool. And, yeah, we've, we've definitely had an eye on it for a few years. Yeah. Um, I went to the Kalamazoo Bee School talk a, few, um, a year and a half, almost two years ago. Uh, it was one that actually the first videos because I got permission to video the keynote speaker and post it. So I have those. I primarily recorded it for my own like note taking in a way. Um, but um I have Michael Palmer speaking mm -hmm. at the Kalamazoo B school. I have two videos on him. And that it's a pretty big, it's a regionally attended event. Yeah. There's a lot of amateur beekeepers. There's a big club in town. One of our neighbor, well, about mile or so down the road, yeah. um, quite involved with bees and, and pretty good, although she's got a terrible allergy to them now. Yeah. And singing she may never be able to keep bees. Um and we have some of 
their honey. It, it's very nice. We might so. be able to get some used equipment from her, uh, sadly, if she's on the... I've seen, yeah, there's a lot of controversy for one, and I'm not an expert, but a lot of controversy about bee equipment. Yeah. <clears throat> what type of hives, what style of hives. Um, I know some people like the plastic frames and the plastic inserts. Some people think they're not, natu not natural enough and the bees don't produce a comb that well, is as, nat as natural. Um, there's there's a lot of I, I don't have an opinion on it either way because I don't well know well enough. We Although I do think with, that yeah. you know, there's people that do completely natural hives. To um, the two things I've heard is you may want to think about the synthetic frames versus the natural frames. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that pour out naturally, some of those things look like a nice idea. I hear they're actually not the best system um, that they can. I don't know. I, I've just heard be be wary of some of the stuff that's being promoted. Um, but there's some very innovative, uh, neat ideas out there. So uh, we're definitely interested in it. And a lot of people doing beekeeping in our area for sure. Yeah. So we have another question from Tina. So that last question was from Terry. This next question is from Tina. Since she just got dumped on with a foot of snow, over a foot of snow, she said, what do you make to keep yourself warm from the inside out using what you have in the pantry? And she did li list mm -hmm. a couple of her own ideas. Um, but just what you have on hand, basically. What would yeah, you I mean, we've got a we've got a chest freezer that's pretty full right yeah. now. So we always have chickens. Uh, yeah. So With chicken soup and chicken and noodles or chicken and rice. That's we always, always have good. chicken. We always have pasta. Um, <laughs> I've, I've got lots of pasta around. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we like, um, uh, we've, you know, we've got, uh, you know, I like working with bacon and cured pork. Yeah, and we um, have a whole hog in our freezer right now, We just too. finished a whole hog. That I've was, actually got to produce some of the sausage on that still. That was from Pratt Family Homestead. We yep. bought a hog off them. So I've got stuff on that. Yeah. Um, I like the idea of, of, you know, beef stews and beef bourguignons are always really nice or Lamb shanks, although I don't typically have lamb shanks just hanging around for a snowy day. Uh, restaurants, I did a lot more lamb shanks. You're not close enough friends with Dan. Yeah, I got <laughs> friends that you have. Lamb is just kind of expensive. No, it's, it's not so expensive. Uh, Grass-fed homestead. I know. We're I know. just not physically close enough to them. Yeah, we've, I've got friends in the area that do yeah, some really nice do. lamb, too. That, yeah. Um, and we had some lamb sausage in the free in the fridge. Yeah, I really like uh, merguez, which is a lamb and red wine and spice sausage. Ooh. Greek some of the Greek sausages are also amazing. They have orange peel in them and stuff and typically made with lamb. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so those are good. I like the hot chocolate idea. I like mulled wine. I make it very rarely, but, you know, a cheap, cheap bottle of red wine and mulling spices and sometimes a little bit of orange or, fr or fruit. Uh, some people put... Um, They'll put in then Kirschwasser or brandy or other things, and they'll fortify the wine. I think when you've heated it up, it's already kind of heady and, and perf awfully perfumey. The people who put the hard liquor in on top of it, I think it's just too much. But <laughs> I know it's traditional in some areas. So I made pancetta. Actually, we used some pancetta tonight. Yep. I have like one more piece of a hung pancetta from about two years ago. We had beans and um, greens tonight with pancetta and the beans. Um, yeah, so we... Uh, so I had a hung pancetta. I made a whole pancetta, uh, cured, went through the curing, and then hung it. Now this new pig, because we're, we're running a little, uh, sh you know, we're running a little short on time with all the things I have going on, yeah. and I don't have a good hanging area right now. I have too much going on, and we maintain a commercial kitchen and license in our, in basement. our basement. I don't want to confuse things hanging close to that as being part or not part of our commercial license. Yeah. So what I did was I actually did the cure. I put it in a food saver or a cryovac bag, and then I have a thermal circulator or sous vide temperature control, and I did a low cook. I did about a six-hour cooked pancetta, which is the way you get in the store a lot of times. The, the cheaper style is cooked. And so I have a cooked pancetta. We haven't broken into that yet, so a different contrasting way of doing it. Hi, the Neil's Homestead. So um, what do you think more fruit and vegetables and restaurants? Restaurants, a um, couple things are going so Unusual going on. Yeah, so vegetable centric dining um, is is you know been a big talk for a number of years and plant plant forward, uh, plant based food. Uh, a lot of people look at it for health. A lot of people look at it for sustainability or cost issues, um, things like that. 
Um, I look at a lot of it as being fun and inventive and, and trying to put things out there. But I think restaurant chefs have been leading the charge of handling vegetables in proper ways, more interesting ways, and using more variety for quite a while. I've done depends fine, on what city. Yeah, and I've done fine dining my whole career, and a lot of it on the East Coast, where we had a lot yeah. of access and a lot of knowledge, and the standards are pretty high. Around here, you're still seeing a lot of a lot of broccoli, a lot mm -hmm. of everything. Every plate gets pretty much the same, same vegetable thing. of the yeah. day. Uh, just steam it. It's still a secondary. So non-inventive. <laughs> I found. I think about ten years ago, when we designed a plate, it used to be. So you talk about starch, veg, protein is a, a and sauce and garnish. So those are your components on a simple plate. So you go, all right, what do I want to serve? What's the protein? And you decide it's this. I've got snapper. I've got, you know, a lamb chop. I've got a whatever it is, and that's everything's just around that. And then maybe I'm going to put some type of, you know, what's the starch? What's the you know, the calorie thing, is it going to be a bread pudding? Is it going to be a potato? You know, what is it going to be? Oh, oh, we need a green vegetable or we need two vegetables. We need a green and a non-green vegetable. And that's how you teach students at first, these three or four component plates. Yeah. And that's it. And then, you, oh, what's the sauce? At this point, I find the vegetable just as important as the protein. So as we reduce the size of the protein a little bit, I can tell you it's not about health, it's about cost. When you're talking 16 and 18 dollars, for a good quality filet, um, and then you've got to portion it and things like that. Lamb chops, some of these things are approaching into the $25 and $30 a pound for premium items. Uh, you can't put a lot on a plate, especially if you're in a big city and you've got a huge rent. I didn't work in Manhattan, but Manhattan rent can be up to $500 a square foot. We were just outside. So how do you generate enough revenue? Well, you need to shrink down you know, ahi tuna, $30 a pound for sushi grade, things like that, sushi one. So you, you, and you don't need to eat that much. So I look at the protein, but Free, the starch, you got to eat just before. So. <laughs> yeah. so the starch and veg become, um, meat and too. Yeah. Just as important that what, so I'm going to design a plate around everything. And so the old time chefs and old time managers you still hear this a lot. Why are you paying so much for vegetables? All right, so I paid $3 a pound or $5 a pound for a vegetable. I'm paying $15 a pound for the beef. What? Yeah. What's it, you know, I'm saving you money. Now they're thinking, well, a case of broccoli is only, you know, $16 on a good day. And geez, why can't you just buy a case of broccoli? Ugh. But, and broccoli's good. It's There's fine. a lot of good it's things fine, you can, yeah. well, you're also, people just steam it and throw it on a plate. And have, yeah. Uh, so you can do creative things with all those things. So I like to do a lot of melanges and, um, what is a melange? A blend. It's just there a, you so you're going to use your, your, yeah, veg, your vegetables and your starches or starch roots together. Mm -hmm. uh, so you may cook them separate, but get them blended together. Uh, you may add in nuts or fruits or berries or different spices. You might brown that off in a cake. Uh, or you might, you know, make a little bread pudding that's stuffed with things. And we're not talking a sweet bread pudding um you know savory bread pudding and and all these things so i like to focus on the full plate now and how it all goes together and i think that's a trend that's really a long term it's been going on and chefs have gotten a handle of that small towns um they're working on it uh but it, it does help your food cost it helps your general health and it allows your cooks to be interested and you shouldn't just be throwing a vegetable on the plate you should be thinking about how, How does it go, go on there? It? How do you prepare it? It's not fire another pan of broccoli in the steamer and it sits on a steam table and you keep throwing them on plates as the plates go out until fire another pan, uh, you know, that type of thing. So it causes cooks to think about their food properly. Uh, so all around it, it works pretty well. So what goes with what? Yeah. Well, and are there any in interest, specific interesting fruits and vegetables that you most people would not have? thought about trying uh, I use I use a lot of you know sunchokes in the winter I like to use a lot uh, I tend to use a lot of finger length potatoes and small you know a size the little ones. potatoes because you can do a lot of things with them you can also cut coins a lot of things you can cut thin coins and you can saute coins Brussels of sprout, potatoes and stuff well, many of roots. anything yeah if you can cut okay. it in a coin why do you have to do it in a spear of broccoli I had a chef where we would take Green beans and broccoli, cook them down soft but not losing their color. Add a little bit of potato, puree them into a loose, chunky puree, and we'd make a canal or a football shape, and we would 
put broccoli. He wouldn't serve broccoli because mm -hmm. unless it was for a kid's thing or it was on a specific yeah. request for a party, we wouldn't bring broccoli into the place because everybody else served broccoli all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a little bit extreme. But there is a place for all the traditional things that I find that you can blend in. Um, you know, I use chestnuts. I do a lot with Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts, you can do shaved. You can do browned and seared. You can do, um, you know, you can fry the, the petals or saute the petals. Mm -hmm. um, you can blend them with all kinds of things. So you can cook them in about 10 different ways. Um, so not there's, just roast them. Yeah, you can roast them whole. I mean, there's... Uh, not just boil them. Um, yeah. Boiling gets a little bit stronger and more cabbagey. Sometimes you need that cabbage. Cabbage, you can do all kinds of things too. So I think people, we took a long time where we were used to meat being the center plate and cooks either through lack of knowledge was like we just steam it or we roast it or we bake it and we put it on a plate. And maybe we put a fatty sauce on the top of it. Uh, going back to some of the European and French roots, cooks are forced to what is the best way to prepare this and get flavor and present it and what can i do you know how how many things can i do to it is without yeah. losing its character a lot can, of asparagus lovers here we grow asparagus and like this is a yeah. prime asparagus not right area, now so. i mean yeah, yeah we grow a lot of it a decent amount here but i um, do brussels sprouts i like to do them with um big chunks of bacon chestnuts uh sometimes some dried cranberries or cherries um you know put in some uh, and I'll do a, a blend of, of an our apple. Sometimes I just do some fresh apple apples, chunks. Yeah, that's good. Um, so we'll do that. Uh, that works well. Blanch the Brussels sprouts real quick. Cut them in half. Sear them face down in whole butter or bacon fat. Get them nice and brown so they really get toasty. Almost to the edge of burned. And then you use um, the flavors of those sweet items and, and the creaminess of the chestnuts and uh, things to bring bring all the flavors together. Yeah. So, yeah. Pecans are good. Yep. Like, pecans are really nice. I like working with pecans. Uh, using vinegar is one of the big underutilized areas is using vinegar to brighten up things, um, whether it be cider vinegar or white wine vinegar, red wine vinegar, balsamic vinegar, obviously. If you watch out, it can stain because uh, <laughs> it's so dark. You need to be careful on how you're using it, but it's got a real nice flavor. Uh, reducing that down into a glaze or a syrup. So vinegar is vinegar's something we've as American cooks gotten better and better at, at sneaking in vinegar and making things really show off. <laughs> oh, <it's, laughs> you have to eat again after this. <laughs> Le love to see some yep, more raised cabbage is awesome. Ground cherries. Ground cherries, yes, of course. Ground cherries, we love those. I have I been love using those. ground cherries for years. Um, sometimes in salads or on meat garnishes, you know, or, or but I like to take the cape and pull it up and twist it uh, so it makes a little little fan. And I'll use those to finish off desserts because while well, they can be a little bit, a lot of times we're getting the New Zealand or the Israeli import ones, which are, are bigger and bright orange, a little more tropical than our, we grow them naturally here. Yeah. But um, yeah, we end up with, uh, um, I like to use those as a garnish. So now you have a fruit salad or you have some a fruit garnish with a chocolate item or a plate. Kind of looks a little boring it's just your regular fruit or cut fruit if you put one piece in on to finish it it all of a sudden becomes your garnish i do not like using the mint leaf unless there's a reason to have mint leaf mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason just to have green or to have mint for just because every dish has to have a mint leaf so start switching it up and and uh, so that cape gooseberry is um one of my uh, one of my go-to a ground cherry same thing it's one of my go-tos for desserts, but it's great for savory. I've done um, compotes and jams and, and things with it, too. So. Yep. Not canned veg. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't care for asparagus for a long time. I still don't like it very cooked. Uh, also, yeah. uh, Lightly cooked is nice. Somebody in the house bought canned asparagus frequently and likes it, and I can't stand it. I don't even like the smell of it. Huh? Um, oh, you're ha growing yes. up. I'm like, I don't. <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't mind. Um, canned vegetables tend to kind of ruin the texture. It blends the flavor, so it works fine with corn. Um, you know, there's a few beans are actually beans work really well canned. Uh, and so there are things, but in general, canned is my, I, I'll take frozen all the time if I can't get good quality fresh on most things. Canned, I'm a little careful uh, because they just don't present as well as I'd like most of the time. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you're also making food look pretty half the time too. Yeah, it's just it's you know, but canned is amazing when when you need to hold it for six months or a year yeah. or three years and you have no other choice. Uh, canned food will save the world. So <laughs> that's true. So do we have any other chef questions? Well, there was a question way Correct. back on what oh, was boy. the new pasta flavor. Oh yeah. So for those for our pasta company, my pasta company, we well, did launch a new actually, item. Explain, this week. explain your company because most of these people haven't ever been here before. So yeah, so a year and a half ago, I started West Michigan Pasta and Provisions. Uh, I make fresh extruded pasta. Uh, so that um, so it's Italian imported equipment, brass dyes. We press it and extrude high quality organic semolina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Asparagus the is pretty asparagus. rough. Uh, canned peas also. We didn't have any canned peas around the house, but they're rough. Yeah. Um, My mom loved canned so peas. So anyway, yeah, so we do that. So I, I make the pasta very traditional, like a small village shop in Italy, although we're an American company. Uh, and then we uh, slow air dry it, and we think we get excellent texture and flavor and just mm -hmm. a really good quality pasta. Uh, so I sell that locally as a wholesale and retail uh, through the farmer's market to a I bunch of restaurants. Mine. And we do it online also. And that so. I, I I did put in the link in the description of all our videos, um, recent videos as well. So um, yeah. if people are interested in checking so it the, out. So the new shape is a jiggly. It looks somewhat like an escargot, but it, from the top, it also looks is like a... downstairs? Um, I'd have to look. I could look. Uh, it looks well, if you want. No. It looks like a lily. You could probably find a... Like a There's calla There's a picture lily. on the website. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it looks like a lily, and it means lily in Italian. Um, and then we launched it for the first time this week as a fresh item. I don't have it dr fully dried down yet. And um, we did a special run. We do our chef collections, which are limited runs. And, and the idea is this one doesn't have a recipe with it yet, but typically mm -hmm. I have a recipe card with it, and it's to show people how they can cook at home by taking maybe a few extra minutes or a couple extra steps or spending a small amount more can create a restaurant quality meal at home. Mm -hmm. um, and so we use that as a way to bridge the farmer's market to a, a more of a fine dining experience uh, and how you can you can do that. And we put a lot of those web uh, recipes on the web page for the pasta company as well. So yeah. if, even if you're not wanting to order pasta, if you just want ideas for pasta dishes. And we're adding to those all the time. We're so. constantly yeah adding to those. Um, sometimes our videos, we put up videos on that webpage and they tend to be posted through part-time permies, um, but we're making them for the pasta business. So like uh, we did a mac and cheese one um, last week that was really well, for them. that was a request for... That was a request from this group, but it was also for the pasta We just company. doubled it up yeah. and... and logoed it to put it on the website for that yeah so yeah so the the flavor which we ran new is russell hanout so uh, i don't know if anybody's heard of it or had a russell hanout it's a spice blend it's not a spice in itself uh it comes middle from, eastern no it's north african north african okay it's north african traditional morocco mm. and russell hanout actually means um top shelf or the top shelf so it it's very much like curry. Curry doesn't mean anything. Curry means blend. Russell Hanout means the top blend, the best that you have. So if you go to the spice shop, it's either going to be what they think to be the best blend or the best spices, the best quality, or it could mean um, it's the most expensive. So it's going to have um, either turmeric or saffron, nice rich yellow. I added an extra, uh, extra turmeric to this blend because I wanted a really rich yellow pasta. And then um, in that, typically there's a decent amount of cinnamon, and then there could be things like clove and allspice. Um, could be a whole variety of things. I was buying a coarse ground one out of Terra Spice in Indiana a few years ago. I have a different one right now. And it was coarse, and it actually had threads of saffron in it and chunks of and pieces. It was, um, And so it's, um, think of sort of like a curry without the heat. Um, and it's more earthy and rich and dark brown spices. Uh, so if you're afraid of curry powder, it may, may be still a, a good deal. So we put a, a decent amount of that in to get a rich yellow and uh, kind of a nice note. I think it would go really well with the Christmas season mm -hmm. and, um, and and also being able to do it with some of the braised meats or, you know. Winter food. Good with tomato sauce yeah. too. So, yeah, so that's just a new one to do something new. We're always trying to launch 
some um, things that really are new to people in our area or potentially new and push the boundaries as the farmer's market. Uh, we're a chef-driven company. And so and you don't do a lot of uh, flavored pastas in general. I try to limit, limit the flavored uh, pastas. Because the goal is to make really, really good standalone pasta. Yes. Um, and by the way, there is a question up there mm -hmm. from Xavier Hope Thomas said, what is your favorite savory dishes for figs? Well, figs are awesome in, in We stews. still want a fig tree here. Yeah. That's on my bush tree. Bush. More of a bush around here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Chicago hearty is the only Figs thing. are great using them, especially using dried figs uh, mm -hmm. with meat, like beef, um, and creating stews because they create that richness and the sweetness um, so that you, it helps thicken a sauce. So it almost replaces the use of, uh, say, a red wine or some of the other, you know, grapes used for sweetness. Uh, figs can uh, do the same thing. Um, I have used sliced figs also in, in demis and in sauces uh, to coat meats. And uh, yeah, they do really, really well. I really like using figs. Uh, fresh figs are fun, but they tend to go bad so fast. Uh, you have to use them quick, you lose them. Mm -hmm. uh, do beggars purses and stuff, savory wise, but, um, or, or sweet wise, but uh, dried figs, you know, I've worked with the green ones, the brown ones. Um, what we had? We had some really good brown figs for a year. We got a whole ton of them, um, some really big mm -hmm. cases, and they were the lightly sugared packed. We were using them a lot on cheese boards, but we cooked them into some stuff too. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, you can puree them for the pulp, and, and they really work nice in sauces and braises. Um, also doing a lot of fig vinegars and, okay. and pomegranate vinegars, which are Middle Eastern things. Uh, they're almost like molasses. Um, in fact, hmm. sometimes they're called pomegranate molasses, pomegranate vinegars. And so we use those to enrich and, and bring a lot of depth in some of the sauces. When you are making a sauce or gravy for pasta from fresh tomato, are you allowing the seeds into it or not? I do. Um, mostly out of complication of removing seeds, you can grind. So you can make your sauce and either before or after you can run it through a grinder. Um, and you can pull the seeds out. Uh, so a lot of people say that the seeds are bitter, and if you bite into them, they can be a little bitter. Some people, it says it bothers their stomach, it causes acid reflux, or if they have digestion issues, they don't want the seeds. So those are good reasons to remove it. I'm not sure that's fully the case. What we do know with a ripe slicing tomato, that jelly around the seeds is the most flavorful, the most tomato-y tasting portion. So if you remove that, you're removing the best of it. So generally, I do not seed my tomatoes unless I'm doing um, like a concasse of, of tomato, ch fine chopped or quick sauce where I'm using fresh tomatoes and a little olive oil and just finishing it. Then I'll seed them. What I tend to do, whether it be a Roma or a slicer, I'll cut it in half so the gills are opened up. I'll squeeze it real hard and I'll shake it one or two times and I'll try and shake as many of the, the seeds out as possible. Mm. Um, I'll get well over half of them out and then um and and then the other thing i can do is uh, well i probably blanched them already i've removed the skin I'll, so i'll shake the seeds out and that allows me to make a salsa or other things uh where they may be even more distracting and have the majority of them out if i really need to be careful with it i'll do a petal where you cut them in quarter you skin out the the ribs and you're left with the blanched de-skinned bottom petal mm -hmm. And then you can cut it into really thin slices or dice. That would be for a very, very dressed up garnish. Um, but um, I have, uh, I don't do that because I don't find that the seeds are highly distracting, but I do know there's mixed opinion on that. Yep. And Suburban Hillbilly, as far as figs, um, the only fig tree that will grow in Southern Michigan, and <coughs> we're really on the Northern end of this, but it's called the Chicago Hardy. Um, and from what I hear, it's the only one that'll grow and you have to baby it a little bit and have it in a microclimate on like a south wall or something People like that. People try and push it so they grow fast because otherwise the figs are barely developing as the yes. season gets cold. That's the big problem. It'll survive. It's just where, whether or not you Get it on a hillside, get it on a, you know, along a house, concrete area, yeah. shield it from Keep the it heavy warm. winds or cover it well. Most people cane them all the way down to a few inches above the ground in the winter. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't survive the cold weather. It's that they take a frostbite and burn from the wind and that can kill the whole plant or will just scar it and they won't they scar won't grow it, up 
and they won't uh, they won't. So produce. it actually brings it. So you have to allow it time to send a whole new shoot every year. Yeah. Develop the leaves, develop the fruit. So that's why you want to push it uh, with extra heat. Now some people keep them in a, a greenhouse or in mm -hmm. a three season area, and they do great. They get an extended growing on them. So. Maybe if we ever get a Chicago Hardy, we could put it on the south side of our house, right next to our greenhouse, yeah. and maybe extend a hoop over it for the winter. <laughs> yeah. So there's so, uh, but figs are very doable. Yeah. So yeah, we can. Um, it's just we're on the northern edge of, and that's really one hardy variety that um, you can get up here. So our yeah. my permaculture teacher over the summer, they have one on um, the southeast corner of their house. And they basically, as it gets cold in the winter, they put like one of those um, portable greenhouses over it so they can help the figs ripen up just a little further. Yeah, and a good thing you can do also, so yeah. as you're coming into the frost on cold weather, not only cut it back, but you can mound it with some dirt or heavily mound it with straw yeah. or cover it with a you know big planter. Um, any of those things do the, the um, bulk of the cold and then remove it as you get into the early spring. Uh, yeah. and, and that will generally keep it going year to year. And so they do pretty well. Yeah. So best herbs for the kitchen garden. Um, well, I probably my biggest go to that I use the most is thyme, mm -hmm. fresh thyme, English thyme. And we have regular thyme and lemon thyme in our garden. And right I like now. lemon thyme. It's a little distracting, but it's a nice nuance for many yeah. things. So thyme is what I use the most volume of. Basil is nice and it's so good when it's fresh, but basil is very fleeting. As we know, yeah. it goes bad in a matter of a week or less. It has a lot to do with the picking conditions and the storage conditions. So you need to have a constant supply. So it's great in the summer, but I don't worry about it too much in the winter. Cilantro. Um, cilantro we use quite a bit and that's pretty hardy you can grow that indoors you sometimes need a lot but it grows fast um, so cilantro is good and neither cilantro or basil freeze down well and they don't dry well by the time you dry them um, all the all the nice flavors have mostly dissipated those oils are gone I mean dry basil has a purpose for starting a sauce a long cooked sauce it has the richer oils uh, Greek oregano is great. Yeah. Uh, one of the lesser known ones that I really like to use in place of Greek oregano and oregano uh, in general is savory. Mm -hmm. So it looks a little bit like a thinner rosemary um, stem, but a little softer. Tastes like oregano. And so I really like to replace when I do a Greek salad, I like to replace the oregano component with savory. Hmm. Put that in other salads. Um, you know, and of course, uh, I mean, rosemary is, is really nice. It can be overpowering, but the resins on the, the rosemary, fresh or dried. And the rosemary is great because dried down is different, but is is very usable. Uh, more so usable than, than uh, basil and stuff. Thyme also grows, um, you know, dries down well. Yeah. So, uh, so those are probably my go-to. Have margarine and don't know what to do with it. Margarine's nice. Margarine is a nice blend because it's it's less aggressive than oregano. Uh, so you're using the same things. It's a little more floral. Um, and, and it's, yeah. Uh, margarine, I have a really good Christmas bratwurst recipe. Um, Polson's book on charcuterie has oh, a yeah. Christmas brat or Polish sausage. And it has a lot of margarine in it. Mm -hmm. And it's awesome. I and think Brian, it has some coriander in it, too. What's his first name, Paulson? Brian. Brian Paulson is from Michigan. He's from Michigan, yes. Or at least spent most of his career here, but I think he grew up in Michigan. Yeah, and you've had some classes I've with him. I've had a couple of classes with him, yes. Which is, by the way, anybody into charcuterie, it's... He's like, sort of the living legend of American uh, traditional. He's learned how to make charcuterie and sausages chives. from around the world. Yeah, chives. Any of the onion <laughs> family, of course. Yes. Uh, I mean, you're going to use them constantly. Uh, so chives are a really nice way to pick things up. Parsley is great to add bitterness and finish. Um, sometimes it gets overused, but it's also kind of indispensable. Parsley stems go into everything. All my and tarragon. sauces. Tarragon I like. Tarragon is can also be really overpowering, but it's a really nice uh, flavor. Um, I like mm -hmm. Cherville even better than Tarragon. Okay, 13 Moons. There is something genetic with that statement. Yeah, 20% of people cilantro there is a genetic trait where some people who taste cilantro it tastes like soap so yes yeah, so there is about 20 25 percent of people yeah. who cannot stand it um so you but, just have to skip it yep 
but there's the rest of us who love it <laughs> and don't think it tastes like soap. Yeah, it's very nuanced. Uh, it's a, yeah, you have a, a flipped genetic marker. It's just, uh, and you either have it on or off. And if you're one way, it uh, a very vibrant, fresh, herbaceous, yeah. citrusy flavor. Uh, and if it's, it's the other way, it tastes like, like soap. soap in your mouth and it's just terrible. Yep. So. So yeah, that's that's actually a very genetic thing. You either love or hate cilantro. And tarragon I really enjoy. It's okay dried, but much better fresh. Just go easy with it. So tarragon has a light menthol um, flavor, but you actually have so basil and tarragon. They all have they all have um, anise menthol -y components, but some are very fruity, and some are very harsh. And and tarragon is extremely fruity and light and and. Uh, shareable even lighter than that. Shareable has a little leaf that people mistake it for cilantro, mm. but it looks slightly different, and it's super, super mild and fine. Uh, I like to chop it and put it on top of meat. Yep. So that's that's probably one of my hidden uses. It's kind of hard to get shareable sometimes. Even the big purveyors don't have it on hand a lot, except for the big cities, but it's a great item. It's perfect hillbilly. I like a little pico de gallo in my cilantro. Yeah. <laughs> Not a little cilantro. Cilantro, <laughs> or coriander, as most of the world calls it, yeah. um, is really used around the world aggressively in, in you know, vast amounts uh, around the world. Yeah. Uh, we use a lot less in the United States, but we're learning, learning to use it more. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Try making... Um, Try making um, um, baba ganoush, a roasted eggplant, and putting a whole lot of cilantro in it. That's how they do it in Trinidad. They use a wild cilantro or the culantro, mm -hmm. uh, like in sort of the Mexican cuisine, um, you know, the Latin American stuff. Try uh, putting a bunch of that chopped in with a really dark charred eggplant or grilled, smoked grilled eggplant. Take the, the caviar and puree that up. Um, and add a whole bunch of cilantro, and it's really good. They eat that for breakfast. Have you ever heard of Job's Tears? I have. That's a, a bean, Not right? Baker's Creek. Um, <coughs> I don't know what that is. I, I know the name. is. I've... <laughs> you have been genetically modified. No, we all have some variations in our genes. Um, <laughs> we don't always know which ones do what, but we all have some variations in our genes. That's why we're not all identical. Um, okay. So any, yeah, I mean, I, we go back to the jokes here. I yeah. only know the name. I don't know if I've ever worked with, but is, is it a bean or am I mistaken? I don't know. You want me to look it up? Yeah. So this, this is an interesting discussion. We have our European and somewhat our world herbs and spices that we use and there's uh 30 of them or so and um but if you th every region has its weeds that are flavorful and it's interesting when you start getting into detail how much um how many different nuanced herbs uh are used in, in local and regional cooking oh tall grain that's what yes okay yes i i know of it i've never worked with it yeah um, I would, we don't really grow too many grains. I mean, the grains that we grow tend to be for chicken forage, um, and things around here. So, I mean, grains are a harder thing we don't, to grow. We don't have enough area to grow or a harvest or and a way to thresh a lot. And just the use, the, the difficult and use and the amount of energy yeah. versus just go buying a high quality amount of something. Yeah. It's not a, it's not as useful because we're not on a farm. So. Talk about peppers, please. How many pe different types of peppers went into our oh, we pickled peppers? Had eight, six or eight. We didn't have a real great pepper growing year this year. We got it was hot and nice, but um, we had a kind of a drought time where they kind of right during their takeoff period. If it was a little bit later, they would have yeah. you know thrived a little better. We were getting a bunch. It was just they yeah. were all just starting. They were to grow. stunted and then they kind of took off late. So. Right, right before frost. And we so always we finish heavy because Michigan yeah. is a short grow season for the higher heat. We always finish too early where they're just starting to get good. And you're like, oh, here we go. And then all of a and sudden then also you realize, we get frost. <laughs> like we got two poblanos that actually went to maturity yeah. and got nice and dark. Fenugreek, yes, I have. Uh, fenugreek is used in some curries, um, and I've used it in some stews, and it has sort of a earthy and funky flavor to it. It's kind of a weird 
kind of hard to describe. I don't use it in much, but I've, it's funny. I had it in a couple of restaurants. It's one of those things that sits there for years and just does, you never get the whole container used. It's, okay. Yeah. So Suburban Hillbilly, you wanted us to talk about the peppers. You mean the pep, the lacto-fermented peppers that we did? Um, we have a whole video on that that just released today on how to make lacto-fermented hot peppers for pepper sauce. Um, but um, we basically used all our six varieties of hot peppers that we grew and made two different sauces, um, which are pepper sauces, not salsas, because you don't want a whole spoonful on it. You want just little drops on it. But you said you can make them into salsas or use them as a base for a salsa, like with fresh, yeah. right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, you can use it as to fill out your fresh salsa with the pepper sauce. So pepper sauce is really a little vinegary, a little salty, and, and, and quite hot. Uh, a couple, of, yeah, dill is way underutilized. Some people are kind of adverse to it. They they really think the fermented dill pickle or the dill seeds. Fresh chopped dill is quite nice. You can finish all kinds of soups and sauces. Um, it's very, um, especially with a squirt of lemon. Uh, and the dill, it's it's very sort of brightening and refreshing. You can finish it on meat, uh, do chopped herbs, and and toss it with fresh chopped herbs, things like chervil and dill, and mm -hmm. uh, put it in salad dressing. So dill is actually very very nice, uh, but uh, you got to watch it a little bit. Uh, it can it can get overpowering. Not some people are a little adverse to it, uh, but I think that's underutilized. It grows it's called dill weed because it grows pretty aggressively, mm -hmm. um, grows fast. Yeah. Um, dill butter, yeah, I've seen. Yeah, compound butters that. always take your ex. So you can take your extra herbs, clean them up, dry them, chop them up, blend them into soft butter. Add some salt and pepper if you if you want, or some onion product like shallots or even a little garlic. Go easy on them, or even garlic powder. Roll it up and freeze it, and then you can cut patties and melt them over things, or melt them into your vegetables. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to have it on hand and always have. A, it's called a compound butter. Um, hotel butter or hotel maitre d butter is your classic base it has lemon juice salt pepper uh shallots and um such and so you can have that with any blend of herbs and spices ready to go and it's a nice way to preserve it for months um so so yeah kaffir lime yep, yep. the question on the lime leaf there is a special tree that grows in the tropical areas like thailand malaysia singapore it's yep. called a kaffir lime it produces a very small lime um and and there is you use the leaf you use the leaf and a lot of curries it's a double you can always pick it out right away it's a double leaf it's about this big dark green and waxy tropical leaf but there's there's two of them it looks like they were glued end to end huh. it's the weirdest thing uh, i actually i have some in the freezer <laughs> so while he goes to get that um okay i'm just reading some of the other things here um you have a couple in the freezer yeah. He'll show you what the kefir lime leaf looks like. These these were greenhouse grown locally, and they've been here for a while. They're probably a little freezer burn. So yeah, um, you could grow them inside. They there. hold really well frozen. There's the camera. There you go. And so you can see how it's got this double leaf. This is bigger and smaller. These are about the same size. Um, and it has you just uh, you steep them in your curry. So in your coconut milk or your your curry spices and broth. Oh, I can smell that. It has a smell of lime and her herby. Um, that is the Thai curry that I love. The yeah, it's in Penang curry and a lot of curry. It smells like Fruit Loops. It does. Uh, although lemongrass. Lemongrass. Kind of if you put in a lot of times you put lemongrass. Oh. If you put lemongrass and and um, kaffir lime together, it smells like Fruit the Loops. The Malaysian curries. Yep. Have that. It too. also smells oh. a little bit like cleaner. Some of the... <laughs> I and, can and see sort of, that, yeah. Uh, so that's what it is. Uh, the leaf is a little too hard to eat unless you cut it up super, super thin. And it's indispensable in some curries. It's one of my favorite um, seasoning flavors. Are you using that for your talk at all this week? <laughs> okay. No, it's not native. He's doing a, he's doing a talk at the community college uh, community doing class. A cooking class. Cooking not class, class, not a talk. Um, in a hands-on cooking class for uh, food from Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, so you may yeah. find those in the frozen section at an international market, but you're best to go to an Asian market. 
Uh, and if they're primarily Chinese, they're probably not going to have them. They need to really be focused more on Southeast Asia. On Southeast Asia. So Thailand, yeah. Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, yeah. uh, products from that area, if they're just a, a straight Chinese, it good luck. It smells so good. He opened that up and I'm like, all I could yeah. think of And those are kind of, those are a little bit older. Like but. Southeast Asian curries. Mm -hmm. It was so It only cool. takes a few leaves um, in a, in a whole pot. But think about yes, aromatherapy. Like, think about lemongrass chicken or something like that that yeah. you would have that's cooked in a light coconut milk and shallots and a little ginger galangal, which is uh, lesser ginger. Uh, that's yeah. that's how you create that flavor profile. Anyway, yeah, I bet you could grow that tree indoors under lights. Yeah, you're gonna need a pretty tropical mm -hmm. environment, um, and I think it gets pretty big. Yeah. But you get a small one. This one is being grown in a local Mama, greenhouse. We grow Thai, thai basil here, too. Yeah, Thai basil grows in kind of cinnamon yeah. basil or Thai basil. Yeah. A whole uh, variety. It, it takes off a little later. Mm -hmm. It doesn't grow as fast, and it's a little more... Uh, it takes the ups and downs of the weather harder, but it, it yeah. grows fine. Through the middle of the summer, Thai basil is great. Uh, holy basil and cinnamon basil and variants and different names yeah. and different purple basils um, and yep. stuff too. So they have a little different flavor. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's I think if you can ever find it. <laughs> Mama Woods in Ten B could grow the lime. Okay. Yeah. I, I bet you. I would do it. I would yeah. be very excited to do that. Yeah. Um, um I think we, it's a wonderful flavor. We are in six A, five B on the kind of edge of both. So um yeah. Unless we're going to in a very heated greenhouse or inside the house under lights, we probably yeah, can't do you that. Need a... Yeah, and we don't keep our house very warm either, so it'll go in eight feet. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds about right. So yeah, sure. you need to be in, in our passive greenhouses aren't even good enough. You need to have an actively heated greenhouse. Mama Woods, where are you in Tenby? What yeah. state are you in? Are you in Florida or something? Um, okay. Anyway. In southern Florida, they can grow some bananas. They, it's oh, yeah. not really a commercial crop, but. Yeah. So we should wrap this up because it's almost 1030 and we started at nine o'clock. But um, we will, we do this, for those of you guys who just joined us for the first time this week, we do this every week at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, every Sunday. Uh, so we do our forage feature. We do ask the chef. We could talk forever about food. Our whole channel is about pretty much everything food from the ground to the table. So, um, for any of you guys interested in that, we have chickens, we have gardens, we have do foraging and, um, we're developing a food forest. That's a slow process. We just built a greenhouse that'll have a video coming out off our front door. Um, and, we also have videos coming out on breaking down and uh, the processing of uh, hogs. So uh, our friend's right. hogs and the red wattle that you got from the Pratt. Uh, mm -hmm. We were help, We helped with the processing uh, live to butcher uh, at our friend's house. So we have a whole variety of things, you guys. So my background does involve basic restaurant training in both classical preservation, charcuterie, and butchery. Well, you're... Um, Certified executive chef. Yeah, but even that doesn't necessarily. I it just I work with some. Test. I work with some <laughs> traditional. Yeah. Some traditional chefs where those were sort of priority areas where the way we trained um, that differentiated from you won't you don't have to be able to do any of those things to be a really good right. operating chef. Um, but I happen to have the experience to work with some of those things, and I don't do those things every day. But I have a pretty good, uh, pretty good command of them. People who do them every day are going to do them a little faster. But. Yeah. And if Roots and Refuge is still in the room, thank you for sending us everybody our way. Yeah, that yeah. was awesome. Oh, my gosh. Um, I did not know that they were on tonight um, because I don't know. I, unless they started doing that as a regular thing, I don't think they were doing it <coughs> regularly. Mm -hmm. But anyway, thank you guys um, for joining us tonight. Yep, Come all back. The, all the regulars, all the uh, new newbies. people. Um, Other people that fell in here accidentally. Yeah, and we'll see you guys next week with another Forge Food feature and some more talk about food. So um, we get back onto this page where I can actually shut it off. <laughs> but anyway, 
I hope you guys have a good night and good week, and we will definitely see you next week, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Good night.